Welcome to the History of North America. I'm Mark Vinette. Join me on a deep dive into the life and times and exploits of Samuel Champlain with the help of excerpts from David Hackett Fisher's book, Champlain's Dream. The Sieur de Champlain This inquiry begins not with a thesis or a theory or an ideology, but with a set of open questions about Champlain. It asks, who was this man? Where did he come from? What did he do? Why did he do it? What difference did he make? Why should we care? The answers to all these questions make a story. It begins where Champlain began, in a small town on the coast of France, looking outward across the Bay of Biscay toward America. Champlain lived his formative years and was born around the year 1570. We know next to nothing about Champlain's mother. Her name later appeared in Samuel Champlain's marriage contract as Marguerite Leroy. Probably Champlain's mother had relatives in fishing ports and trading towns throughout the region. Champlain's father left more traces. Antoine de Champlain earned his living from the sea, working his way up. A document in 1573 identified him as a pilote de navire, a pilot of large ships. In the years that followed, Antoine moved upward from pilot to the rank of master, then to the rank of captain. A later record identifies him as capitaine de navire, a commander of large ships. A man who held this rank was expected to lead in time of war or mortal danger. Antoine also went up another step and received a commission from Henry IV as a naval captain. At the same time, Antoine was also getting ahead in yet another way. He became a shipowner, buying small shares in several vessels, as even large investors did, to spread the risk in a dangerous business. This put him on yet another level and took his family to a different place. Owners were the men who hired the crew and employed the officers of their ships. They acquired the cargo and took the lion's share of the profit. Owners were called shiplords by seamen and officers. When an owner went to sea, he had the best accommodations on board. The officers deferred to him. Even the captain, who had command authority, the master who sailed the ship, and the pilot, who was skilled in seamanship and navigation, gave way before a shiplord. Antoine de Champlain succeeded in rising from humble beginnings to high rank in maritime France. He also did well in another way, increasing his income from investments in ships and voyages. Samuel Champlain always wrote of him with pride and respect. In Brouage, Antoine de Champlain became a man of property. The Champlain family moved to one of the larger houses in the town. They also acquired a second house, and then a third. They were not of the nobility, but they were prosperous and flourishing. Others in the family were getting ahead in the same way. An uncle from Marseille also rose through the maritime ranks to become a man of property. Their cousins in La Rochelle were doing well too. All his life, even in very hard times, Samuel Champlain had an optimistic way of thinking about the world an attitude that comes easily to people whose families have been moving up, especially in childhood. Always at the center of Champlain's life was his Christian faith. Samuel Champlain was named for a hero of the Old Testament. The biblical Samuel was the first of the great Hebrew prophets, an upright judge of Israel, known for his stern integrity. Champlain's forename strongly suggests that he was baptized as a Protestant. In the 16th century, the region where Champlain was raised was one of the most Protestant areas in France, the center west of France, from La Rochelle south to the Gironde estuary. The greatest concentration of Protestants was in the area around Brouage. Champlain would later marry into a Protestant family that converted to Catholicism. All this evidence points to the same conclusion. He was probably baptized and raised as a Protestant and later converted to Catholicism. At an early age, Champlain probably went to an infant school, perhaps several of them, a common practice in the early modern era. These schools were run by housewives in their kitchens, especially in Protestant communities, where rates of literacy were higher than among Roman Catholics. The purpose was to teach the fundamentals of faith, the habits of discipline, and the rudiments of reading and writing. At a later age, Champlain may also have gone to an academy that existed in Brouage. The students attended for two years and were taught the exercises and games of cavaliers, in particular equitation, mounting, jumping, and trick riding. They also learned to draw, to dance, and to play the mandolin. 
Mainly, they received instruction in the arts of war and the use of weapons, which Champlain mastered at an early age. After graduation, they went into the army or into the service of a grand seigneur. In one way, Champlain's schooling was very limited. Like his contemporary, William Shakespeare, he had little Latin and less Greek, and he was not trained in the grammar and rhetoric of classical learning. Champlain spoke a fluent and muscular French, as strong and colorful as Elizabethan English. In maturity, he was able to speak English well enough to converse with British seamen on technical subjects. Champlain also learned enough Spanish, and likely had a smattering of other languages to get on with the Dutch, Portuguese, and Basques whom he met in his travels. Long voyages under sail with crews that spoke many tongues made a ship into a language school. Probably that was the way Champlain learned his modern languages. Champlain's most important school was the sea itself, and his father was his master teacher. One can imagine Champlain as a small boy, standing beside his father on the deck of a ship that was underway in Brouage Harbor. We might see them studying the flow of tides and currents, feeling the unsteady play of onshore breezes, cocking a weather eye upward at the sky and the sails, watching the movement of shipping, dodging other craft, and carefully avoiding anchored vessels that were shifting on their moorings. All these things had to be done at the same time as they conned their ship through the narrow, twisting channel of brouage toward the open sea. It was a rigorous school for a bright young lad, with small margin for error. The tidal waterways from the town led outward to the Bay of Biscay. Beyond the bay lay the ocean. Champlain tells us that he made many ocean voyages as a child. As the ship moved out of sight of land, he had yet more skills to learn as a blue-water sailor. In his youth, Champlain was probably taught to steer a course by compass and dead reckoning. His father would have instructed him in the use of an astrolabe to estimate the elevation of the sun precisely at noon, which yielded a simple measure of latitude. He would have mastered the use of a backstaff to observe the angle of elevation for Polaris, the great north star. It was best done at twilight, when the pole star and the horizon were both visible. It was no small feat to take a sight while standing on a moving deck of a small ship. The horizon itself seemed to rise and fall, and the stars appeared to dance in the sky as the ship rolled and pitched and yawed in a running sea. Then came the computations, with adjustments for the limb of the sun, and others for Polaris, which, in Champlain's era, was not as near true north as today, and had to be corrected by the use of pointer stars nearby. There were other lessons. As Antoine Champlain rose from the rank of pilot to master to captain and owner, he became responsible for the business side of a voyage. Young Samuel learned about the world of commerce, markets, commodities, and money. He learned to deal with men of business who spoke languages different from his own and absolutely had to be understood. He learned that some were men to be trusted and others were not, and many things hinged on a matter of judgment. He learned that a voyage could be dangerous in ways that had nothing to do with wind and water. The coastal waters of France were infested with corsairs, pirates, and predators. A seaman in the sixteenth century was also a man-at-arms. Champlain learned the use of the great guns that every large vessel carried for her own protection. He also had to learn how to deal with irritable passengers and unruly crews, who were often a challenge in unexpected ways. He would have studied these things while he watched his father deal with the routine crises that arise on a wooden ship in an open sea. Champlain had fourteen years of this instruction before he was twenty-four. The drawings on his maps show us that he was fascinated by ships of all sizes, great galleons, small craft, and anything that floated on the sea. He always had an eye for the beauty of a full-rigged ship, or the sleek lines of a sharp-built patache, or the charm of a simple shallop bobbing at anchor in a quiet cove. Like any experienced seaman, he rode of the sea with deep respect, for he knew what it could do. He marveled that he was still alive when many a good seaman had drowned. There was always a curious mix of fatalism and instrumentalism in his attitudes. Champlain tells us in his writings that he never learned to swim, which was common among men who kept to the sea during the early modern era. It belied a strangely fatalistic attitude that is very distant from our own time. All these attitudes began to form early in his young life, when Champlain went down to the sea in ships, sailing with his father from their home in Brouage, along the coast of France, and into the Western Ocean. It gave him an education for a life of leadership in the years to come. I'm Mark Vinette, and I hope you're enjoying the ride.